What's going on guys? It's your boy JMK, Fresh Prince of Healthcare. Back at it again with another Rapid Fire PA podcast. This is episode number three. I've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, regarding these audio style videos and having it available on Spotify and really getting just really great feedback and that you guys want more episodes. And so yeah, today we're going to be going over episode number three. Got a number of questions I want to answer for you guys and different topics I want to address. Thank you guys again for submitting questions, whether through Instagram, YouTube, all that good stuff in the comments. And again, don't ever hesitate to comment down below any questions you want answered in the next Rapid Fire PA. This really is just me being able to rapidly answer your guys' questions and cover high yield topics. So yeah, I have a new setup. I bought a new mic from Amazon, pretty cheap, I think like 20 bucks. And hopefully the sound or the audio does sound better for you guys. Let's jump right into it. So the first topic I want to talk about, again, with everything going on in this world, is equality in healthcare. So when I what do I what do I mean by that? Does the color of your skin as a patient make a difference in how you're treated? How do the numbers look as a person of color, as a pre-PA or pre-med, things like that? My my thought and my kind of point I want to make is anyone that says racial disparity or inequality in healthcare isn't present, it's just not true. There definitely are disparities. There's inequalities, unfortunately, and there's, you know, people are treated differently based on their skin color. As much as that sucks to say, that is something that is present in our world and even in medicine. So, you know, we're told to treat all our patients with the highest quality of care, but that's not always translated. There is some prejudice and some inequality and that plays a factor. And I think we really just need to be more aware of that and really make an effort and do our best as providers ourselves and do our best to really treat the patient more than, you know, their illnesses, treat them more than their skin color, and just treat them like family and treat them as, you know, how you would treat your family members or someone that you are very close to and doing what's right. That's the most important thing is doing what's right and doing what's best for the patient because not a lot of our patients are educated in different aspects of medicine. Obviously, that's why they come to us to get help. It's our job to not only treat them, but to educate them, inform them and be their advocate insurance drives a lot of our care and sometimes the best care or the best medicine isn't available for patients because their insurance doesn't cover it but yeah it's that is present out there and you know people are treated differently based on their skin color whether they can speak english or not all this stuff and it's not something that really should play a role but unfortunately it does especially here in the states this channel is very pa oriented because i myself i'm a practicing physician assistant I've shared my journey through my pre-PA, PA school applications, going to PA school, working as a new grad, and that's kind of been my basis, right? And the disparities even exist in PA school and applying to PA school and practicing PAs. So Harrison Reed PA showed this great statistic on Instagram. He said 12.6% of America is black, 7.6% of PA applicants are black, but only 3.1% of PAs are African American or black. 12.6% of America is African American or black, but only 3.1% of PAs are African American black. Those numbers don't correlate. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be that huge drop. So what, what are some things that contribute to that? I think for me, that disparity and that inequality really comes down to a few things, resources, privilege, and opportunities. It's generally been proven that people of color have less resources, obviously less privilege and less opportunities than Caucasian uh, and white, white people. Again, this is not a knock on Caucasian people or the Caucasian population. This is more to shed light on how this disparity and this inequality exists for non-white people and the different opportunities and the different resources that aren't available or not as, that just aren't as available to people of color. I think a great example of this is studying for the MCAT or studying for the GRE. A lot of us are blessed to be able to have that financial means of you know, signing up for having tutors, signing up for a prep course, that opportunity is not as available for African Americans or blacks, you know, and that's not right. And there should be equal distribution of those resources. And it's just not, that's just not how it is, unfortunately. And again, that's where I feel like that's just one little avenue or little aspect of where the resources and the opportunities aren't available uh, to people of color. And you know, things need to be done. For me personally, what am I going to do? What can I do to help to help shift that number? You know, 12.6% of America is black and bring that 3.1% of PAs being black up. What can I do myself personally to help bring that 3% up of black PAs? 
And for me, like I mentioned, I'm a, you know, more of a PA driven YouTube channel. But if you're African American, black, send me a DM on Instagram and I'll help edit your personal statement, answer any questions about the application or, and just be a resource to you guys. And I want to make that aware because I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. Yes, I have a YouTube channel. Yes, I have an Instagram with a little bit of a following, but I answer almost all my DMs. And I think a lot of people aren't aware that they can reach out to me and I'll most likely get back to you if it's not like a, you know, if it's not like a personal thing, but if it's like a PA related thing, I'll most likely answer your question and do my best to help you or point you to the direction of getting the answer if I, if I can't answer it myself. In my last video, someone called me out and said, are you not going to help out Asians <laughs> or Caucasian or Latinos or Hispanics? And no, I never said that. <laughs> All of this stuff is not anti-white, anti-Asian, anti-everything that's not black. Right now, we're focused on black lives and our, you know, our black brothers and sisters. And yes, all lives do matter, but right now black lives matter the most. And there's just been the injustice and racism present for way too long and we need change. And I think for me personally, I can help in that way of helping African-American or black pre-PAs do my part in that sense of answering any questions and being a resource for you guys. So again, DM me on Instagram if you have any questions or need any help with anything. Uh, my Instagram handle is at Fresh Prince of Healthcare. The next topic is um, total patient care hours. What do I recommend in terms of how many hours you should have when applying to PA school? I always tell everyone, regardless of your GPA, regardless of your stats, all that stuff, I always recommend to have at least 1,000 hours of patient care hours before applying to PA school. So to break that down for you, one year working full time at a position, a patient care position, like in a medical assistant or EMT or physical therapy aide, that puts you at a little over 2,000 hours. I think it's like 2,200 hours. If you worked half time, not full time for a year, you can get those 1,000 hours. Obviously, a lot of us are students. A lot of us have jo different jobs, different volunteering to do, classes to take. So it's hard to do a full time gig. But I just wanted to break that down in the sense that for me, I had about 3,000 hours. And my first 1,000 hours, I gained during the two years of my junior and senior year. And I was all through volunteering. And then I worked full time for a year post-grad and that's where I gained my other 2,000 hours. So I always recommend at least 1,000 hours because a lot of schools have a minimum. I know the minimum seems to be shifting like more to 500, but 1,000 seems to be a common uh, minimum. And if you have at least 1,000 and you have a solid GPA and application as a whole, it just makes you a stronger applicant as opposed to having a few hundred patient care hours. So, and I also have a video on my channel, on my YouTube channel going over patient care versus healthcare experience. So you guys can figure out what the differences are and you know, if your experience counts as one or the other. So I definitely highly recommend you to check out that video. I think it's labeled, it's called patient care versus healthcare experience. And you can find that on my YouTube channel. The next question is what can I do to stand out outside of a college campus. So I think outside of classes, what can I do to stand out? So as cliche and non-helpful this statement is, be as well-rounded as you can, but pursue interests that you're passionate about. When I say that, I mean in the sense that it doesn't always have to be medically related. The opportunities, the clubs, the organizations, the activities you're involved in, it doesn't have to be like a pre -P only a pre-PA club, only a pre-health club, or a medically focused org. I definitely recommend you guys to take leadership roles in those type of organizations and societies, like a pre-PA society or a pre-med organization, because that does make you gain those leadership skills and qualities that are important to work in groups, work in a team. I do recommend you to have different experiences that also make you unique and make you stand out. I know one of my friends, this is not related to PA school, but one of my best friends who is a third year, going to be a fourth year medical student, he loves basketball and he was a basketball coach, I think for like seven year olds or eight year olds or like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know the age, but helped kids learn basketball skills, teamwork, things like that. And I think that was like an awesome thing for him to talk about at interviews. And it was a way for him to give back to his community. Again, it wasn't a paid opportunity or anything like that. So he kept to, you know, pursuing something related to his passion of basketball and he was able to be a coach. And I think that's an awesome experience to have on your resume or application when applying because it just makes you more well-rounded and it makes you stand out and talks about your passions, things you're interested in, but also volunteering and giving back to your community. So uh, if working with the underserved is something you're passionate about, focus on that. Focus on events, focus on activities that impact the underserved communities in your area 
and make that a bright spot in your application. For me, I think I did kind of incorporate a little bit more of working with the underserved and volunteering. So really try to tie everything together and I think it's an important thing to have in not only medically related activities, but things that you truly enjoy doing, you know, whether that's golf, whether that's painting, drawing, all these kind of things, you know, video making, vlogging, food review, all of that good stuff. I think it's important to talk about. Um, at one of my interviews, I told someone I, I enjoyed making YouTube videos, but this was before I even really had a channel. And that was a topic of conversation for like five to 10 minutes of the interview. So things that you enjoy doing, you know, make sure you pursue those as well as those medically related activities and incorporate that into your application. So Jasmine KPA and Miss Natty asks, any bays lately and are you single? So yes, I'm single. <laughs> Um, there's a girl I like in Huntington Beach, um, but we'll see how it goes. There's no, I don't have a girlfriend right now, no title or anything, unfortunately. You know, everything happens for a reason. If things don't work out or do work out, and you can't force anyone to like you or pursue something they're not wholehearted about. So yeah, I'm single. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I love being in relationships. Uh, I love anniversaries, being cute and all that shit. So um, I also have a lot of weddings to go this year. I want to bring a plus one and someone that I'll have a good time with. Currently, honestly, I'm single. But yeah, I mean, I obviously want a girlfriend and all my best friends, all my close friends are in relationships. It doesn't make me have any pressure. But again, like I mentioned, I prefer being in a relationship over being single. I do like being in a relationship. I feel like I do make more of an effort when I'm in a relationship. So yeah, but I'm single. Mr. President Carter on Instagram asked, what was your hardest experience on a rotation or during didactic? So I would say a few things, but I'll make a separate video on this. So I haven't actually shared this with a lot of you guys, and I actually failed my first end of rotation exam during clinical rotations. And I missed it by a few questions. I was pretty close. So that was pretty heartbreaking, um, but I haven't really shared that with you guys. Um, I've, sh I've shared that I failed my first biology class in undergrad, but I never mentioned anything about failing exams in PA school. And I failed my first family med EOR. And you're like, what the hell? Are you crazy? And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably the hardest thing that I experienced. It was my first EOR, like I mentioned. It was a family medicine EOR. And my rotation that month was actually pretty chill. I just didn't know how to study for the EORs and you get a topic list with conditions. It was super broad and I wasn't as proactive as I, I should have been and definitely underestimated the difficulty and the spe specificity of the exam. You know, after that first exam, I passed all my, all my other EORs. I realized that more effort needed to be made and I needed to be more specific and more focused with my studying. So I actually started to make charts of all the conditions that, you know, I had to type out myself and go through each of those. And I went through all the conditions and the topics multiple times. And I think that's important is you can't just go over everything once. You got to go over things multiple, multiple times because the EORs are pretty specific. I think the most important thing is I passed my pants on the first try and I still have that mindset of, you know, continuing to do my best to grow as a provider and always put my patients first. But yeah, that's something I wanted to share with you guys. And something that was really difficult for me at the time when it happened was I failed my first EOR during clinical rotation, but here I am now uh, practicing certified physician assistant. And I feel like I've done as much as I can for my patients so far and really connecting with them on a personal level, but also doing, you know, what's appropriate and doing the best plan of care for them. So your scores don't determine how well you'll be a provider. Obviously nobody likes failing and something I just want to share with you guys. And you know, you can always bounce back. It's always about how you bounce back. You can mope and be sad for a little bit. You got to grow from it. You got to reflect on it and see what you can do better. You know, it was my first EOR, but passed the rest of them afterwards and passed the pants. So I'm happy. So the next question I got was from YouTube comments. It was motivation advice for those who are starting their second career in medicine and want to pursue PA. I think the physician assistant route is a great route for anyone pursuing medicine as a second career. It's obviously a lot shorter than medical school, but allows you to do similar things and treat patients. If you are pursuing PA as a second career, usually you'll probably already be settled in your career or you know have a family, have kids, things like that. So medical school is probably not as feasible because you have a family to support. It's, it, makes your, it makes it a lot harder and it makes the journey a lot more difficult um, to pursue. And it creates a lot of doubt, creates a lot of questioning yourself and whether this pursuing this profession is the right thing for you to do or you know, should you just stick with your career or should you give it your all and you know, pursue PA or medical school? I think for me, the best thing for you to do is, or the best advice I can give you is, make sure this is something that you really, really wanna do because even when you make that career change or that shift, it takes a lot of time. You know, the process of becoming a PA or a physician 
there's a lot of work. You got to take the prereqs, you got to have patient care hours, you're gonna have shadowing, all that stuff to stand out. And you know, I think having it having PA as a second career does make you stand out. But you definitely got to make sure that this is the right thing for you and your family. And PA is a great route for anyone pursuing medicine as a second career. And I really just advise you to shadow and make sure this is something that you want to put all your eggs in a basket for. This kind of brings me to my next question that I got was, did shadowing give you a good feel of what exactly a PA is and does? And what was my shadowing experience like? What did I do and any advice? I always tell students, pre-PAs, pre-meds, the absolute best way to see what the life of a doctor or a physician or a PA or a nurse practitioner is like is to shadow them because you get to experience firsthand what that PA does on a daily basis or what they do in their job and see their roles and responsibilities and their duties and their patient interactions. It gives you just that picture of what you can be doing in that role and in that specialty. For me, I shadowed both an ortho and a derm PA. The ortho PA, I saw patients with him in clinic and was also invited to the OR for a few days. I wore a gown. I wasn't like sterile or anything like that but I was able to shadow in the OR. So I got to observe some knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, and got to see also the clinic life for an ortho PA. And then for the dermatology PA, all of it was in clinic, saw different procedures, consults, follow-ups. What I did to prep was I brought a notebook with me, I dressed business casual, Especially in clinic, you want to dress at least business casual. And then I brought a water bottle and like a protein bar or snack to have on hand. When you're with a patient with the provider in the room, don't ask too many questions. That would be my advice. Wait until you have downtime, whether, you know, it's after you guys see the patient or the provider asks you, hey, do you have any questions about anything that we've talked about? That's when I would address the questions. But if the PA is doing, you know, a procedure or they're educating the patient on something, I would hold off on asking questions until the PA has finished or they've given you the opportunity to ask questions. Be 15 minutes early to your shadowing day, know where you need to be. But really, shadowing is the best way to know and feel what what it's like to be a PA. And I think for me, I need to do more as like a, a YouTube blogger to show you guys what a uh, life of a PA is for in, in my situation. So I do want to make more of those videos. I've just, you know, as a new grad, I don't want to, you know, have my camera out like that all the time. So and I want to be respectful and obviously hip up, but slowly getting more comfortable. And I think I'm going to start filming a little bit more for you guys in clinic. But again, I'm still a new grad. It's, it's only been like five months since I started officially. And I don't, I'm not even at a full schedule of patients yet. So yeah, so this was Rapid Fire PA episode number three. Please drop a like if you had some of your questions answered. Please comment below and let me know what questions you want answered. And again, if you're African-American black, pre-PA, DM me on Instagram. If you have any questions about your personal statement, application advice, anything, DM me and I'll do my best to help you and do my best to uh, reach out in any way that I can. Don't forget to be like my blood type, be positive. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.